Welcome to Circa. In this Eat Here episode, we will be talking about a lot of excellent things to eat in one of the world's most creative food cities, Los Angeles. But don't worry about taking notes. There will be maps and info on the places mentioned in this episode in the Circa app. One easy subscription unlocks the world. So sit back, put on your headphones, and let me tell you about the tastiest trends in oh-so-trendy Tinseltown. Let's eat. Serka, love the world you live in, and we'll help you explore it. Los Angeles has always been a place where people come to find themselves, to reinvent themselves, to reimagine themselves as something new and sometimes become famous. The food here has followed. LA has long been an experimental playground and the home for any number of culinary trends. One reason is that LA sits at the perfect confluence of ingredients. California is rich with spectacular produce. Roughly 50% of all the fruit and vegetables in America are grown here. For another, Immigrants from around the world have set up cultural pockets in neighborhoods throughout the city, infusing L.A. with new flavors and ideas. The eyes of the world and pop culture's tastemakers have always congregated here. And long before there was Instagram, having a celebrity at your restaurant could catapult you to stardom. And so, Los Angeles has always had the kind of restaurants that attract attention— Glitzy, glamorous, attention-seeking. Often the meal was secondary to the atmosphere and the clientele. For a long time, food was not the focus. Today, the scene has changed significantly. There are still plenty of places with glitz and glamour and paparazzi, and that is a part of eating in L.A. But if you pull back the red velvet curtain, there's so much more. And it's so much better. This is a story about how L.A. imported some of the best food from around the world and then made glorious fusions of it. So let's see some of the city's stars, plus some of the best bites that don't make the top 10 lists. And yes, a few of those can't miss sparkly, star-studded, roped-off Hollywood show ponies. My name is J.J. Duncan. I'm a television showrunner here in L.A., I've eaten with Oscar winners and gang members and billionaires all over this city. I can tell you, the gangsters know some of the best places. New California On the world stage, Los Angeles is an infant. It doesn't have the deep culinary identity of the European masters or the old-world resonance of New York or the flavor-packed indigenous roots of South America. L.A. is a blank slate with a bounty of gorgeous produce and an epic coastline, and so has become the perfect canvas for contemporary artists of all kinds. In 1982, the New York Times applied the label California Cuisine to the emerging culinary trend coming out of the cities of L.A. and San Francisco. Sometimes now called New Californian, this style has a few markers that differentiate it from what came before. Let's start with what high cuisine was. In the food capitals of New York and Chicago, the best restaurants were defined by the royal culinary traditions of Europe, mostly Italian and French. Rich braises, creamy sauces with demi-glace, plenty of butter, weighty potato dishes and cast iron pans, thick sheets of pastry, and vegetables marinated and cooked to within an inch of their life. In a word, heavy. Delicious, but a weighty endeavor. California cuisine broke from that trend and went very strongly in the other direction. The freshness of the ingredients sourced locally— 
if it could be pulled from the ground or plucked from the tree the same morning it landed on the plate, that was ideal. It leaned on game and poultry and seafood rather than red meat, experimented with light, clean compositions, incorporated the spices and techniques of the local ethnic populations, the immigrants, and combined flavors from different backgrounds to create new ideas. Today, Los Angeles excels at this. Crispy salmon skin chicharron at Mirame, a twisted shakshuka with baguette, fresh from the oven at Republique, zucchini blossoms and stracciatella on a sumptuous blistered pizza crust at Ronin, wood-fired prawns with cornbread pudding and Italian olives at AOC. The list, believe me, goes on. All of it with delightful California wine sourced from vineyards just north of the city. There's so much to eat with so many different origin stories, it's hard to know how to organize all the things you'll want to try. This is hard for people who live here, too. So first, let's take it back to the roots. Step one is to visit one of L.A.'s spectacular farmer's markets. Most of the best chefs in the city shop at the markets, and some of the best local producers haul their little gem lettuces and fresh-cut herbs, free-range eggs, artisan cheese, heirloomed black tomatoes, purple potatoes, and green Turkish figs to sell directly to the locals. It will be mostly organic, and often the farmers or family members run the stands, and they can tell you with pride the difference between the six different varieties of avocados they have on offer. Ask them questions. The largest markets are at the Wednesday Santa Monica Market and the Sunday Hollywood Market. They stretch several city blocks, and you could easily spend half your day there, buy groceries for a week, gifts for most of your family, and enjoy both breakfast and lunch. Most markets open at 8 a.m., and that's when you want to go. You'll spot celebrity chefs, sometimes other kinds of celebrities, and have your pick of the produce. The popular stuff goes fast. If Harry's berries are at your market, go there first. Buy the seascape berries and don't look at the price. They're grown in Oxnard at a family farm just north of L.A., and they are the best strawberries you'll ever taste. But they will be gone by 10 a.m. Also, this is where you want to buy baked goods, breads and pastries, croissants, and even bagels. The bread in most grocery stores is subpar, but there's an artisan baker at almost every farmer's market and everything at their stand table will be delectable. One more tip, bring cash. You can buy plenty these days with Apple Pay and cards, but the vendors here definitely prefer bills. Almost every neighborhood in the city has a farmer's market. So if you can't make it to one of the big ones, just find the market closest to you. There's bound to be a treasure there. We'll put some links to some of our favorites in the notes. Now, you've had a taste of the land and hopefully breakfast, so we can start exploring how all that wonderful farmer's market produce is interpreted. Remember what you've seen there and how many different ways it can end up on your plate. Let's start at the beginning. Before anything, Mexican. The very first settlers in Los Angeles who were not Native Americans came from Spanish-controlled Mexico. Today, there are thousands of Mexican restaurants in L.A., representing nearly every region of Mexico, with everything from taco stands to four-star Japanese-Mexican fusion. There are a few things you should try, but also be adventurous, which is, in general, the only rule for eating in L.A. There will be plenty of things that are new to you because they are new to everyone. They were invented here in the food trend laboratory that is this city, so try them. This is not a good rule for every city, but for L.A., it's paramount. Occasionally you'll taste something that misses the mark or burns your taste buds off, but not often, and usually not without warning. And look, risk is a part of life. Be bold. We're in Boyle Heights a neighborhood just east of downtown L.A. 
These streets hold a vibrant mix of restaurants that have been around for 50 or 60 years and are embedded in the community along with new upstarts trying to break in with twists on tacos and tamales. While you're here, check out the Casa 0101 Theater for exhibits and performing arts that celebrate and promote the cultural identity of this neighborhood. Despite being named for an Irishman, this area was once largely Jewish and today is mostly Latino, with a strong Chicano heritage and some of the best Mexican food in L.A. Perhaps the most well-known food stops in this neighborhood are Moriscos Jaliscos and Tacos Ibirria La Unica, both trucks. Your food will be served on styrofoam plates. Sorry, Mother Nature, but it will be delicious. Mariscos Jaliscos piles shrimp and seafood in a spicy red sauce called aguachile into and on top of all variations of tostada. It is seriously spicy, so be warned. Also get fried shrimp tacos, any version of super fresh ceviche, and a cocktailis, a Mexican seafood cocktail. If you've never had one, it's a revelation. Only a block away is a competing seafood truck, Mariscos Four Vientos. Locals can argue for hours about which one is better. You can decide for yourself. Also in this neighborhood, on East Olympic Boulevard, is Tacos Ibirria La Unica. Here you want the chivo, goat birria, in whatever format strikes your fancy. It's a deep, rich, herb-laced stew piled into a tortilla and deep fried. Delicious. Hungry yet? I've got another truck for you. Tacos Arabe serves delicious spit-roasted pork flavored with pineapple and cumin and chile on handmade tortillas called pan arabe that this family-run joint brings in especially for you from Puebla, Mexico. The name literally means Arab taco, so called for the Middle Eastern influence on Puebla that shaped the profile of this delicious dish. Now this truck usually serves in the evening, so check the hours before you turn up. Also, be sure to ask for the pan arabe. It's not always listed on the board. And get it fried. Except for the fact that you'll be eating off of paper plates on the side of the road, it feels entirely too special to have come off a truck. While you're in Boyle Heights, check out a couple of historic LA landmarks. Mariachi Plaza, where mariachi musicians have gathered since the 1930s, waiting for people to pick them up for gigs, and the Boyle Hotel across the street, built in 1889. If you're lucky, you'll be there when some of the mariachis are playing for fun, and you'll get a bit of a free show. Now, we've only scratched the surface of Mexican. There are hundreds of other spots I could recommend, and many other regional specialties, but then I'd never talk about anything else, and there is so much else to talk about. So check out the app for mole and cochinita pibil and more tacos, and let's move on. All that Asian. Vietnamese, Thai, Chinese, Japanese, Korean. One of the special and also infuriating things about L.A. is that it sprawls all over a vast area. It can be quite a hike to get across town, but it also allows space for pockets of different cultures and ethnicities to root themselves in neighborhoods around the city. I won't endeavor to name all of the Asian cultures represented in the city, but you can spot them among a strip of storefronts or over several square blocks marked with flags and signs in a language other than English and the smells of delicious food wafting from the kitchens. Here's what I recommend. You will inevitably find yourself out and about in LA without a plan for lunch or dinner. And equally inevitably, you'll be near one of these neighborhoods with signs not in English, but tantalizing smells in the air. Don't go looking for a burger. Eat here, it'll be good. And you'll get to try something new, which science has proven will make you smarter. It's true. Look it up. If you're in Hollywood and you travel a little further east along Hollywood Boulevard, you'll hit Thai Town. The largest population of Thai people outside of Southeast Asia is actually here in Southern California. Stop in to Roded for duck soup or really anything with duck or spicy pork with mint leaves. And definitely get fried wontons to dip in your soup. 
You can get pad thai, but you know, don't. Down the street is Sap Cafe. Get a spicy salad. There are a dozen kinds on the menu. Or their famous boat noodle soup and a Thai iced tea. And here's a fantastic quirk of dining in Thai town. Many restaurants have small stages and provide entertainment. The most popular entertainer in Thai town is undoubtedly Thai Elvis. Yep, Thai people love Elvis. The secret is that there is more than one Thai Elvis, but even so, it's hard to know where he'll pop up. If we get any tips, we'll put them in the notes for you. Elvis or not, live entertainment is very popular in this neighborhood. At Pattaya Bay, you can order fresh and spicy clams and beer and join in singing karaoke almost every night. Or go to Krang Ted for live Thai pop music every night around 10 p.m. and L.A.-style Thai fusion. Like Thai-style shabu-shabu, traditionally a Japanese hot pot dish, or a Thai version of Hainan chicken. Again, check the notes for the Thai names of these dishes. Sticking to the east side of the city, but traveling south from Hollywood, will land you in Koreatown. Los Angeles has the largest Korean population in the United States, and it is a significant cultural force in the city. If you've never had Korean barbecue, you should try it, and you should try it here. Plates of short rib, shrimp, and vegetables that you toss on a grill set into the table and cook yourself, accompanied by dishes and dishes of pickles and kimchi. If you're too nervous to cook it yourself, don't worry. The servers will not let you ruin your food. Parks is the OG for Korean barbecue, but there are plenty of others. Many of them are great places for groups and parties with bumpin' music and an amazingly colorful clientele. Come for the marinated short ribs, stay for the K-pop or lookalikes in brand name streetwear. After dinner, hang out in K-Town for karaoke, then go to Sun Nong Dan for late night Galbi Jim to soak up the alcohol, a salty, sweet, garlicky, and spicy Korean stew poured over rice. That's a good night out. If you're planning a party, hit up Ava's Lechon, for an entire roast suckling pig that is a truly spectacular centerpiece covered in golden crackly skin. Or you could just get takeout. They do that too. Now, Chinese food. Hold my wonton, this is a topic with a lot of opinions. There is a neighborhood in downtown LA called Chinatown. There are restaurants here, and some of them are good. And if you're in the neighborhood, check out Zen Mei or Yang Chow or the Pearl River Deli for Ban Kot, little pancakes made with coconut cream and topped with shrimp. But for the knock-your-socks-off experience of Chinese food in L.A., you want to get on the 10 and head east. And try not to do this during evening rush hour. Or you'll be sitting in traffic until you shrivel up and die from hunger. You're heading for the San Gabriel Valley neighborhoods of Alhambra and Monterey Park. You want Dan Dan noodles from almost anywhere, especially at Chengdu Taste, where the rest of the Szechuan menu may burn your face off. If you've never had a Szechuan peppercorn, well, it's an experience. Lean on the staff here to help you choose. You want cold sesame noodles at Dai Ho and lamb dumplings at Shanxi Garden, which features food from Xi'an. And if dumplings are your thing, you definitely should visit some of the San Gabriel Valley's dumpling temples. And in particular, you should order Shaolong Bao, soup dumplings. So named because when the sumptuous steamed balls burst in your mouth, a flood of delicious soup pours forth. Watch your neighbors at the table next to you to learn how to eat them properly. You'll find exceptional Shaolong Bao at Mama Lu's or Hui Tu Sheng. But really, try them anywhere here. Don't worry, all these names are in the notes. You can check them later. While you're on this side of town, you could also grab Vietnamese spring rolls and pho to take home with you for late night or early in the morning. Drive slowly down Garvey Avenue and you'll pass a dozen different excellent places to grab authentic specialties from up and down Vietnam that go well beyond banh mi. 
A quick note, in a lot of these neighborhoods like Thai Town, K Town, Alhambra, and so on, it's not uncommon to find places that only accept cash, so keep some in your pocket or double check before you sit down. Now, back through LA to Little Tokyo, the historic heart of Japanese Los Angeles. There have been Japanese immigrants in this neighborhood for 150 years. The Japanese Village Plaza is an excellent place to spend a couple of hours shopping for manga or exploring the Japanese American Museum in and around an excellent ramen noodle lunch, and then a visit to the Kyoto Garden on the rooftop of the Hilton next door. Don't leave this neighborhood without stopping into Fugetsu Do, a dessert specialty shop that has been making traditional Japanese mochi at this same location since 1903. Traditional mochi is an acquired taste. My kids loved opening the box of pastel colored confections, but not so much eating them. Still, it's the real deal if you're looking for authenticity. And now we've reached Japanese cuisine and one of the holiest of LA foods, sushi. Let's be honest, it warrants its own chapter. So. How to do sushi. There are so many sushi restaurants in LA that it can be overwhelming to consider. And unlike some of the other ethnic cuisines, sushi restaurants are not even remotely confined to one neighborhood. They are everywhere in every neighborhood. Most Angelinos will have two sushi restaurants to recommend, one for weeknight sushi, for takeout or an easy lunch when you need to remove yourself from your laptop for a few minutes, and one for special occasions, for ordering sake along with your meal. There is extraordinarily expensive Michelin-starred sushi from the likes of Nobu Matsuhishu, and there is glitzy pop sushi with designer decor, and there is excellent, unassuming sushi from the strip mall joint in the valley where all the celebrities actually go. Here are some rules. Number one, if omakase is on the menu, that is what you want. The chef will serve you what he or she deems best and you want to trust the chef. Number two, if someone recommends a sushi restaurant and it's in a strip mall next to a smoke shop and a laundromat, don't worry, these are some of the best places. Trust the locals. Number three, don't order California rolls. Just don't. Number four, one of the things LA perfected is the ridiculous, over the top, you can't possibly add anything more to it, sushi roll. You'll see them on the menu of the weeknight sushi shops. Sushi purists hate these, but I'm here to tell you it's perfectly fine to order them. It's not traditional sushi in any way. It's sushi that's gotten dolled up to the nines for a night on the town. Number five, if the letter grade on the door is anything other than an A, don't go. There are risks worth taking, and then there is raw fish. People in L.A. take their sushi seriously. Enjoy it. The Jews and the Persians. Some other people that take their food seriously? The Hollywood studios were historically and famously founded by Jewish entertainment moguls, mainly from New York. But surprisingly, it's only recently that you could find decent bagels in L.A. There are, however, a few famous old Hollywood haunts of the Jewish deli variety that are dear to Angelino's hearts. Nate and Al's in Beverly Hills, where little ones can get a bagel strung with a length of kitchen twine to hang around their neck and chew while the adults order corned beef and eggs and sturgeon. Langer's Deli downtown, an arts deli in Studio City, serve up epic pastrami sandwiches. And Cantor's on Fairfax is open 24 hours for when you really need a pickled green tomato and a black and white cookie at 2 a.m. These are joined by some new kids on the block, like Wise Sons and Wexlers, who have broken into the deli scene with trendy new storefronts, but food that upholds a storied tradition.
Since the 1970s, L.A. has seen a different kind of Jewish migration, with large numbers of Sephardic Jews and many others emigrating from Iran and the other Persian states in the region. They brought with them their amazing flavors and spices and dishes like shawarma and kefta and grilled kebabs with tabbouleh salad and hummus, tahini and labne, za'atar spiced pita and baklava flavored with rose water. Like sushi, good Persian, Turkish, Lebanese, and Israeli food can be found all over. It makes an excellent filling lunch or celebratory dinner and carries out quite well. Because you might need a good solid meal that you can take home with you after a blistering day of playing on the beach or hiking in the canyons. Hit up Sunin for Lebanese shawarma and pistachio baklava, or Adana, a Glendale neighborhood institution with tender Turkish kebabs. fusion, pop-ups, and how to do the trendy stuff. But you're in Hollywood, you say. So yes, you've traipsed around L.A. trying delicious things from everywhere else. But what's real L.A. food anyway? And where do the celebrities eat? Such good questions. I can answer the first with a very L.A. answer, and that is L.A. food is sort of a state of mind. More on that in a minute. And as for the second question, don't worry so much about the celebrities. I mean, you can, but if you want to experience L.A. like a true local, you'll pretend you don't care. The things that define food in L.A., fresh, local, and unique ingredients, the strong influence of international flavor, and a penchant for experimentation. You end up with food that has character and style and something of an identity crisis, but in the best possible way. The Koji truck may be the perfect example. In 2008, chef Roy Choi rolled a food truck out onto the streets of Hollywood that served Korean barbecue short ribs wrapped in Mexican tortillas and promoted it on a new social media platform called Twitter. The truck became a sensation. These days, there are five Koji trucks, a taqueria, a rice bowl counter, and a bar, a Koji empire, as it were, all built on the idea of fusing two cultural mainstays into the perfect street food. Fusions of all kinds abound here, some that you really don't think should work, but do. Lots of them are still available from a truck, although food trucks in L.A. have had their moment and aren't the fad they once were. And plenty of fusion creations are the hottest ticket in town, among celebrities and non whether they came off a truck or not. The point is, the fanciest, most expensive, most glamorous restaurant might be the trendy thing to do, but it also might not. It's easy to peruse TMZ and see where celebrities were spotted, and if that's your thing, by all means, go for it. Get dressed up, and if nothing else, have a truly glamorous night out at Catch LA or Chicone's or Kalina at the Four Seasons in Beverly Hills. Splurge on exceptional sushi at Nozawa or Matsuhisa or Q. You'll spend at least $200 per person for the omakase menu at these restaurants that in and of themselves have celebrity status. Plus, they'll treat you like a star. With this said, the truly trendy thing to do in L.A. is to eat the food that's interesting, that's new, that takes risks and takes you to new places. Explore the pop-up scene. They are all temporary. And for the ones that make it big, you'll be able to say that you ate that dish before it was famous. These are the innovative startups of the restaurant world. Chefs trying new things, experimenting with new flavors, or trying to bring their flavors to a new place. They serve in temporary locations, literally popping up, or out of their own garages and backyards, or taking over the kitchens and other restaurants for short runs. Kara Hadawanger, during the pandemic shutdown, served toasty bacon egg cheese avocado and special hot sauce breakfast sandwiches via a bucket lowered from her fifth floor fire escape. People came from all over to have a sandwich delivered by a bucket. Maybe it was the novelty of the bucket, but also people in LA 
We will drive a long way for a really good breakfast sandwich. Breakfast, LA's secret weapon. That brings me to the thing LA does better than anyone else. Every city has one thing. In Los Angeles, it's breakfast. This is in part because LA is a morning town. Everyone gets up and out for morning runs or surfing in Venice or hiking the trails or cycling up the Pacific Coast Highway. And even if you're not hitting the yoga studio at 6 a.m., you still need to eat. People here talk about weekend brunch with a kind of religious reverence, the church of mimosa and avocado toast. And all of the same rules apply to breakfast as to everything else. The best food uses fresh and local ingredients, borrows from LA's international tapestry, and does something entirely new with it all. You can, of course, still get exceptional pancakes, buttery French toast, and eggs done to perfection. But you can also get goat birria and egg breakfast burritos at Milpe Grill in Boyle Heights or kimchi fried rice at Republique right alongside their spectacular French pastries or Spanish fried chicken and waffles at AOC. With, yes, mimosas. Yum. only in LA. Now, lest I get lots of angry letters, there are some last things to mention that shouldn't go unmentioned because they're simply that important to the fabric of the city. If you ask a local, these may not be on their top 10 list unless they are diehards because these places inspire diehard love. First, Pink's Hot Dogs. These guys started as a hot dog push cart in 1939 during the Great Depression. A chili dog cost 10 cents back then. They now have a permanent location, though not exactly a full restaurant, and you can still get a chili dog. But you can also get wild and inventive hot dog concoctions, most named after the celebrities who ordered them first, like the Martha Stewart, with tomatoes, bacon, sour cream, onions, and sauerkraut. It sounds ridiculous, it's legitimately good. Next, all that vegan stuff. Yes, in health-conscious LA, you can find restaurants in all shades and for all kinds. And there are probably better vegan options here than almost anywhere else. And yes, this is food for everyone. For one, Gracias Madre in West Hollywood is Mexican-inspired, animal product-free both fashionable and delicious, and just as likely to attract celebrities as that fancy sushi joint. Get chicharron tacos made with deep-fried enoki mushrooms and grilled street corn, and let the staff recommend a mezcal from a menu with at least 100 options. Third, Neptune's Net. So I recommend this with a grain of salt because I've personally never fallen in love with Neptune's Net the way some people have. But it is unabashedly a quintessential LA spot, as much for the atmosphere as anything else. As you drive up the PCH, the Pacific Ocean lapping on your left, the scrubby LA canyons climbing up to your right, the sun shining and the Beach Boys carrying you along a bit past Malibu is a seafood shack style outpost. Neptune's Net serves everything from the ocean, fried up and crisp and loaded in paper-lined baskets. It's popular with biker gangs. Don't be alarmed if you see dozens of leather-clad, burly folks out for a ride up the coast. They are among some of the nicest people you can meet. Fourth, the Inn of the Seventh Ray. This place occupies a special place in the hearts of many Angelinos, some of them very different from the bikers, and some of them not so different at all. Nestled among the trees in the rustic, hippie, crystal-loving Topanga Canyon neighborhood is an enchanted setting betrothed in fairy lights and open to the clear night sky. Its romantic atmosphere has set the scene for thousands of proposals. Keep that one in your back pocket. 
Along those same lines, Jefferies in Malibu has an absolutely stunning Pacific Ocean view and a beautiful patio that has welcomed the likes of Marilyn Monroe and Frank Sinatra. And last but not least, the Mexican-style fruit carts. They're all over. At parks, on street corners, in parking lots, their rainbow umbrellas are easy to pass by. But don't. They're wonderful. For a few dollars, you can get a giant cup full of fresh-cut fruit like mango, watermelon, cantaloupe, orange, jicama, and coconut. Get it topped with limon and salt and tahine, a chili powder. It's the perfect snack for a hot day. You'll wonder how you've lived so long without it. So from Mexican to Mexican, we've come all the way back around, and in between, we've eaten the food of the world. But really, if you've heard anything, you should know by now that you've only really had the food of Los Angeles. Now that we've got your mouth watering, check out the other LA episodes in this guide to help you explore, understand, and love this city as much as we do. And definitely some advice for getting out and working off all those pork belly tacos. If you haven't already, you'll want to subscribe to Cerca and get instant access to the full guide, plus new episodes on a regular basis. Find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or download the Cerca app where you can also get pictures and maps and notes on the wonderful things to eat and drink mentioned here, plus so much more. Maybe you'll want to hear about the food of London or Mexico City next. Cerca. Love the world you live in, and we'll help you explore it.